Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of In Our Community. So this afternoon we are interviewing Mark Potter, who happens to be the producer of this show. And he's shown up on, the, on several editions, several uh, uh, videos from this show, reading his poetry and getting an introduction to himself. Uh, he's a very accomplished person. He's uh, uh, a poet and an author, and he published a, an arts magazine many years ago in the 70s. Uh, he is a, a Zen student and Zen master, and he's also Stu student. <laughs> a student. Yeah, yeah, I, I have guess to student is always uh, my, the right my, way. Our Zen community will go crazy if they hear that. <laughs> And uh, so he just has an awful lot of aspects about him that, you know, have been attractive to me. Uh, I just met you about a year and a half ago when I was taking the video production class here. And since then, over the last year, I've worked with you making videos here for the In Our Community series. So um, what I'd like to do, though, it's a little bit different. I think in previous shows, you've talked more about the artistic side of your writing. And so I'm interested more in your background. Okay. So I'd like to find out something about where you grew up. You you didn't okay. you weren't raised in California. No, I grew up in the Midwest. I really like the Midwest, and it's a special place in my thinking. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You oh. know, Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Those places are all considered the Midwest, and the reason they're considered that way is because in the early 1800s, the United States only went to the Mississippi River. And so at that time, those states were actually in the middle. They were the Midwest. Now, for people in California, they always refer to places like Indiana as back east. People who are from there still refer to it as the Midwest, mm -hmm. even though it's obviously no longer the Midwest. Uh, I guess I hadn't really thought, thought about, about yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, know where yeah, the yeah, actual where, designation yeah, yeah. came from. So you had told me when we were talking the other day that it was a very small town where you yes, grew up. Yes, real small town, yeah. We'll call it Bloomingdale. It's not really Bloomingdale, but we'll say it's Bloomingdale. Yeah, yeah. To give yeah. us something to say. But it is, but it is small. You said there were only a couple hundred students in your whole yes, high school. Yes, high school was about 200 students, yeah. And the population was only a few thousand. Five thousand. Yeah, yeah exactly so, yeah. right. Yeah. So now, as you, you know, you never know anything when you're in the middle of it. Yeah. But as you look back, do you see anything about that particular environment that kind of shaped your views? Yes, in several ways, both positive and not positive. I feel like the small town. Uh, educational systems when I was a kid in the 50s, now this is the 1850s, no, no, <laughs> uh, was very, very good. I'm really looking back, I had no idea how good of an education we were getting. It was really surprising. Now the other, the flip side of that is that in the small towns, you know, 5,000 people, 3,000 people, in the 50s, those towns were just replete with racism, completely, remarkably racist. There were no people there except um, white people. Uh, we had a, a foreign exchange student come from Brazil. Mm -hmm. It's the first non-white person that was in our town. Wow. And the house he came to stay in was burnt to the ground. Really? That's the level of racism. Wow. Yeah. So, another reason I'm not saying Bloomingdale's real name. You know. <laughs> well, that is very interesting. Though. It's Just, shocking. You know, when and you I, think, yeah. When you think of what was happening in the 60s, you know, yeah, where yeah. we were doing a lot of the, yeah. the transition, I guess, you know, yeah. to a little bit more tolerant community, you right. know, not much before that, you know, right. all across the country it yeah. was like that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the things I really do want to do is, you know, read your poetry because yeah, that's yeah. a really interesting thing. So I'd like to start and then we can come back to a conversation. Okay. So uh, You're assuming I know how to read. So, <laughs> which is kind of... um, 
there were some of your poems that I ended up choosing just okay. because I really okay. enjoyed them and then okay. you have some others. So this was an interesting series. Okay. And I'll, I'll talk about one, one thing I see about this after you've done all of this, but let's start with this one here. It's called Marigolds. Okay. Please consider marigolds. Marigolds are used by some gardeners to keep bugs away from the garden. And those folks, although claiming profusely to be appreciators of plants, are in fact babbling baby botanists. <laughs> These folks, the ones who use marigolds as bug repellents, do not usually and in fact, many do not regard, I, I, okay, and in fact, many do not regard the marigold as beautiful. Part two, I read this poem at a bookstore once during a book signing and some scrimy guy came up to me after the reading to insist that he always, he did use the word always, speaks highly of his marigolds and that I should not generalize about all marigold utilizers. Utilizers, that is to say, persons utilizing marigolds as bug repellents. There is always a fly in the ointment, I wanted to say, but I knew better dreaming of the pork chops and mashed potatoes I had promised myself after the bookstore outing at Cliff and Zelda's all-night shipwreck diner, a name that always reminds me of Adrian Rich. <laughs> and there are so many little things at the end yes. of that that are just so much fun. So yes. You, well, Adrian, you're having wanna... a conversation with someone. Yes, sir. And you want to just close down the conversation. Yes, very you much so. You just want to stop. You're yes. not involved in it or anything. And so you're just about to contend with him about this marigold thing, people who just use them and people who think they're beautiful. But I, but I knew better dreaming of the pork chops and mashed potatoes I'd promised myself, <laughs> saying, uh, that's going to get way too involved. And yeah. I'm really dreaming of these mashed potatoes and pork chops, which yes. is really fun. And yeah. I've got to find out who Adrienne Rich is to okay. you. I know she sure. wrote yeah, yeah. Diving Into the Wreck, yes, which is why yes, I think yes, Shipwreck yes, probably you have that Yes, line. I didn't know you knew that. So but yeah. tell me about that. Well, it's, she is usually, depending on what day of the week it is, she's my very favorite poet of all the poets that ever lived. Uh -huh. And her poem, she has a book, Diving Into the Wreck, and the title poem is Diving Into the Wreck. This poem, to me is one of the best poems, certainly of the 20th century at least. Mm. It's really beautiful. It's just stunning. It unfolds in a very beautiful way. And I oftentimes, if I, I don't know, if I just need some poetic nourishment, I go back and read that piece. Mm. It's very stunning and she's a, She's a great American poet and, and a fighter for human rights. Mm. Well, that's very yeah. good. That's very a great cool recommendation yeah. for people yeah. to, to yeah, use she's just great. to go yeah. in and read something yep. like that. So um, you had told me that you had started writing poetry in your mid-teens. Yes. So now, how did that start? Did that, um, did, did that satisfy a need somehow? Poetry is not something which is really common when you think of 15-year-olds. Right, right, right. So tell me about yeah. how you got started and what that did for you. Um, I, couple things there. I have mental illness, and even though it wasn't discovered until the 1990s, I think I really always had it. And pair that with the fact that our home life, my family, was very traumatic. Uh, my parents were, you know, I don't want to go overboard, but were rather cruel in the way they raised us. And so I was very traumatized, traumatized as a teen. And, I, and I, I didn't have any out. You know, we weren't really allowed to leave our property. We weren't really involved with things. So I started writing as a way to have a way to express myself and try to discover who I was. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. oh, that, that is interesting. So um, as, we, as we grow older, as we experience things over the years, um, we all take wrong turns and hopefully we learn something from those. So now, from your experiences, from childhood, from growing up in the Midwest, from coming out to California, uh, are there any core beliefs, some truth about Mark Potter that you know you think you've kind of discovered looking back and the ways that you've gotten to where you are now? Yeah, I guess what comes to mind almost always when I hear that phrase or read that kind of a thing is later in life, uh, almost, you know, maybe 45, 50, I started studying Zen. And there's something in Zen that's really me discovering my core beliefs. And I think the core beliefs I had before then that I just couldn't articulate. Uh, and a lot of that the way I would say it is uh, we don't we, we humans don't realize okay we're here right now we're here right now we're here right now you know someone and I think it was Adrian Rich wrote a book called The Fact of a Door Frame or something like that and it just it's one of the ways you can say okay we're here you know we can argue about God and all the non-concrete things, non-physical things. But we're all humans, we're all here, we're all going through the day. You know, that it's a very, um, it's a way to ground oneself in, re in real reality, I, mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so then sort of the, a, a Zen or a Buddhist philosophy uh, how how does that come to you? How do you express that? Well, thankfully, uh, Buddhist philosophy is ineffable, which means which means it cannot be expressed in words, and so uh, one will never really articulate it with words. Now, the paradox is that teachers, which I'm not a teacher, I'm a student, but teachers have to use words to say something that cannot be expressed in words. So it's quite a conundrum. Um, so hopefully that doesn't help any, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it does, it's an interesting, yeah. It, Still the truth, it, it even though it's it tough is. to swallow. So, so I wanna go to another poem. Okay. And now this is, even though it's a different name. Okay. It's called Possible Agreement. Okay. It's a follow-on to the Marigold oh, Conversation. Okay, okay. So read this and then we can talk All right, about sir. it afterwards. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, Possible Agreement. <clears throat> Finally, I agreed with him, much the same way as my grandmother finally agreed with 11 other jurors and convicted some guy of robbery whom she felt was innocent, so that she could go home for the weekend instead of being further sequestered. The argument that finally won conviction of the innocent man went like this. A man who walks with a limp rarely brushes the teeth on the left side of his mouth as well as he should. And you may remember that I am attempting to agree with the man with whom I disagree. The young man felt so victorious and justified and successful when, he finally when I finally acquiesced that yes, perhaps some marigold planters do so with admiration of the beauty of the loveliness, the golds and browns, the petals, the smile, a marigold grants each viewer. That Thank is, you, sir. This is a great poem, <laughs> and what I had I had encouraged you to actually read this part first. You did, okay. Because if you end up reading this, it doesn't. You know, it's very interesting. This whole thing, you know, about this preposterous argument, right? That, you know, and right. that's what it is. It right. was yes. just sort of yes. 
it could have been anything. Yes. Not very convincing. And, and what I'm trying to say by doing it this way is, if somebody's innocent and you believe there's innocent, there's no argument to be made that makes them guilty. They're innocent. And so people make up something. You know, we, we make it sound like it's pretty uh, accurate, but in fact, there's nothing you can say that makes somebody who's innocent guilty. You know, that's what I'm trying to say there. And it was sort of interesting, the pairing of this. In the first um, paragraph, you're talking about your grandmother yes. who was convinced yes. by an argument which didn't make very much sense. Right, right. And you now become convinced yes. by an argument that doesn't make very yes. much sense. Yes, thank you. So and it's this just is a, a very is... interesting juxtaposition. Thank I love you. the words. Thank you, sir. And this is true about my grandmother, God bless her. She's been gone a lot of years now or I mm -hmm. wouldn't have put this out in the public eye, but this really happened. She really told that story. Wow. And I think she felt bad about it the rest of her life, but mm -hmm. you know, that's what happened. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. The way it worked its way into yeah. this. Yeah. That was very interesting. Thank I, you, I sir. love that. I love that poem. And, <laughs> You're good at and this. I just <laughs> love the way it works in with the other two. If you had read that first and then go back in and see that, you know, it's, yeah. you can only read them in one order one time. So yeah. unfortunately, yeah, yeah. you can't go back and unread it. Right. But, you know, That's I really true. do enjoy those, yes. those that series of poems. Very good. Uh, there's the next poem to me is really intense. Mm, okay. And it is. Absolutely, of all the ones I wrote that it, I've you read, mean, you, that you wrote, <laughs> and uh, of all of the stuff that I've read of yours, uh, it is really my favorite. Uh huh. Okay. So read it first. I don't know what you're going to hand me now. <laughs> read this first. It's called Medication. Oh, really? You so like read this, this one the most. Read this first, and then okay. we'll have a discussion about it. Okay. Well, gee whiz, I'll have to breathe in and out here. Okay. Medication. To say that he was inept would be generous. Even in touching, no, even in reaching for his medication, he struggled. He now struggles. That is to say, he struggles even now. His awkwardly plaid shirt, which somehow is quite naturally when worn on him, a mockery of everything fashionable. As painful as it is, he reaches for the medication, if only because he must take it. He must take it to avoid becoming even worse, even more awkward, even more... The pill bottle, of course, laughs. It knows only too well his lack of confidence, his infirmaries, the table, his only true friend in this particular endeavor, holds steady. The pill bottle shoots away from his aching, painful fingertips. Nothing could be further from the truth, his fingers say to him. They say to him in another act of betrayal, nothing could be further from the truth than for you to think that you can reach out and sex successfully touch that pill bottle, let alone grasp it, let alone open it, let alone pour two pills out into your hand, let alone lift them to your mouth, let alone... He blocks out the rest of the soliloquy or litany or list, whatever it is, he makes a plan, silently, without any facial expression, to try again later when his hand is asleep. That is a stunning <laughs> last line. I mean, to me, this guy himself is so disso dissociated from his body, his environment, and his body becomes another actor just laughing back at him. And to have this last line where you say, I'm going to try again when my hand is asleep, that's the only way that the self 
can now take control. It's just such a stunning, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful set of words, and I love that ending. It Thank is a big you. surprise. Thank you, know, you that, sir. That last, that last line, I love it. So now, you know, it, it, it feels personal. Is that uh, something about you? It's very about me. I, as a mentally ill person, I take a lot of medication. Plus, I had a heart attack a few years ago, so I take more medication. Mm -hmm. And I struggle every day to take the meds properly. I actually hired someone to call me twice a day to say, take your meds. Yesterday, as an example, I did not take them. Even though someone's calling me twice a day saying, take your meds, I just never got to it. Mm -hmm. um, I think I took them today just before the show. So I just, I really struggle with it every day. I mm -hmm. really do. It's very, this is viscerally true about me. It's, it's an amazing poem. How, how do you, when was that written? Uh, long, long the, most ago. of these are a long time ago. Oh, okay. Most of these were written originally in 2011. Mm -hmm. And then over the years, I've worked on them. A lot of times for me, if I do some editing, then I have to let it sit a month, two months, three months. I was doing some editing earlier today. That's why I stumbled on the first piece because mm -hmm. I didn't grok my editing properly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in fact, in this one, I had I had edited some things out today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, John Chiardi, who's a famous, I don't know, teacher of poetry, professor of poetry, poetry thought leader, said once that a poem is never finished we only just stop working on it. I think it's really true. I think yeah. it's really true. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to turn and get some soda here because my throat, my throat bothers me. Okay. You can see the brand there. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, I'd be curious about sort of your development, kind of the arc <sighs> of your poetry. From okay. You had mentioned that you know your early poems when you were very young and mm -hmm. when you were in your twenties were kind of commonplace and they were very realistic. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've done more work in absurdism and surrealism. So how did that arc? Yeah, when I first happen? started writing, I would say it was more confessional, kind of John Ashbery, Amy Lowe kind of thing where I was just in a lot of pain and I was writing about it, about that pain. Maybe not directly. You know, if my stepmother had said something horrific, I wouldn't necessarily write that down. But I might say, you know, the weeping willow uh, is limping across the parking lot or something. Right, right, right. And that went on for a lot of years and then I started studying, you know, I went to college, studied some poetry there, got to know some major poets, really admired William Carlos Williams because his work is extremely simple and straightforward. And years later, I started writing like him. And I've got another book, which I featured on some shows a long time ago, called Light and Dark, which is um, just simple, straightforward poems. And I did that for a long time. And then within the last five, seven years, I've, I had been always studying absurdism and looking at it and reading about it, but I never really brought it into my work until five to seven years ago. And now it, some of it's, a, it's, a, it's an unusual juxtaposition of simple clarity and confusing surrealism, you know, so. That's where I'm at at this point. Oh, that's interesting development. Let me finish the, with this section okay. with uh, a little more lighthearted poem. Okay, okay. This again Very is good. one of the ones you chose as one of your favorites. Okay, and this one's called Cornflakes. The man walking from the very far end of the grocery aisle, coming this way, not stopping, turning his head, head ever so slowly, to look at the various cans, French cut green beans, beets, 
generic pasta sauce, so-called baby corn. Like a fan, a fan on slow, he turns his head back and forth. I can see now that he has the hands of a truck driver. That is to say, large weathered hands, dark gray hair, streaked with white, and some places balding quite markedly. Next, next is the fresh fruit. For this, he has to lower his head slightly so as to actually be looking at it. He touches the candy bar he, and quart of whole milk in his cart. No one except me, myself, is looking at him. I want to go up to him. I want to ask him if he's looking for something in particular. Instead, I am distracted by a sale on cornflakes. An interesting poem. And it feels like it's just something like a snapshot where you're just drawn into it, not knowing anything about him or his circumstances, but you were just somehow um, involved with some motion, with some activity he was doing. And it just drew you in to become real with that person. So yes, that was a very I, yeah. interesting thing. I think I think men have a tough time. I mean, I'm an older. I'm not only an older guy, but I'm old-fashioned in a lot of ways. Men have a hard time with grocery shopping, any kind of <laughs> shopping, and I always struggle with it. And so, when I see a guy in the grocery store who's having a hard time just making sense of a grocery store. I sometimes I want to help. I don't remember ever <clears throat> going up and interjecting myself in someone's life, but I want to. <clears throat> so that's what it was about. It was based on a real thing that happened. So. Yeah. Well, that's a fun one. So that's a very interesting sample. It goes from a lot of different aspects yeah. of your writing. It's all very, very good. I enjoy it a lot. So in the in the next segment, I'm going to want to talk to you more on the on your philosophy, okay. you know, your, your Buddhism and also your Christianity, which right. is an interesting mix, you know, right. that people might find interesting. Yes. So I hope people yeah. come back and watch the yeah. second part okay. of the show. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, sir. And we'll do, do Bless one you. later. Thank yes, you so sir. much. Thank you so much. And thank you.